Now, let's go to America for a moment to page seven. Okay, not a lot of time, so I'll do this briefly. There's a lot of things you can say about how the reform in the conservative movement adopted Hanukkah. Why is Hanukkah so important for American Jews? And One is because it's a battle against Christmas. I found a text by Isaac Mayer Weiss that in 1865 in Germany, he said we should get rid of Hanukkah. Why? Because Hanukkah is about the temple. We don't want a temple. Hanukkah is about going back to the land of Israel. It's about war. It's irrelevant. It's, about, it's, not, it's irrelevant to reform Jews. Several years later, at the Augsburg Synod of the Reform Movement, says we have to bring Hanukkah back because all those German Jews are celebrating with Christmas trees. Right? Well, I'm in San Francisco still, right? So, uh, what did the reform movement in America in the 20th century make of Hanukkah? Religious uh, freedom of re uh, holiday of religious freedom, very American holiday. And why was that so important for them? Because it was part of what made America a, a special place for Jews that we had this this religious freedom. So it made it made Hanukkah a quintessential Jewish American holiday. Okay, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to read a small part of what we have on page seven. This is a wonderful children's curriculum used by the reform movement. It's not the official curriculum by a guy named Harry Gersh. Maybe some of you know him. I don't know him. So I want you to read the everything that's in bold, meaning the, okay. the head of each section and then the sentence for the next couple of pages. Okay. And then you'll get a feeling for what this curriculum's new drasha on Hanukkah is about. <laughs> Go ahead. Freedom of worship. Only one Jewish holiday, Hanukkah, centers about a war. Jews never take up the sword willingly. Matthias did, Matthi, Matthias did not want war. When many people shouted for war, Matthias ran away from Jerusalem hoping to avoid war. That's why he went to Modena, obviously, right? Sure. Cleansing the temple, each soldier waved a palm branch instead of a sword. The legend of the oil, the right to worship. Most Jews in all ages thought war was stupid. <laughs> freedom to serve God. The idea of religious freedom is followed in all free nations today. It was the first given. It was first given to the world by, by the Jews. Jews. Matityahu, obviously. It's a festival mm -hmm. of dedication. Okay, so tell me, what's going on? What are the values in this drasha Hanukkah? And I think it's very well done, personally. Against war, host of uh, Vietnam. Yes, 1971, we know, I probably was marching with the same guys who were writing this curriculum. And how could they have a pro Hanukkah Maccabees kill the elephants uh, educational thing when they're marching in the streets against the war in Vietnam? Now, what they could have done is they could have tried to struggle with the 67 war, which left an enormous impression on reformed Jews as well as conservative Jews. But that they left out, it was the anti-Vietnam war that forced them to come up with this thing that Jews have always thought that war is stupid. And the only time you're allowed to fight a war is a war for religious freedom. Religious freedom. Now, why is it so important, the religious freedom to rush up? Why? The Jewish minority. And when does the Jewish minority feel the pain of being a Jewish minority the worst? December 1st. Yes. Fourth grade in Waukegan, Illinois. We went for the winter concert. We learned all the songs. Everybody came in his white shirt and his black pants and skirt. We all went into the classroom in fourth grade. All the kids marched out in order to go to the concert and to sing Come All Ye Faithful and Silent Night, all kinds of neutral Christmas songs like that, which I still love. And I stayed in the classroom because my father was the rabbi and I couldn't <laughs> sing that publicly. In 11th grade in my school, now in St. Louis Park, of course, I was the one who led the, led the petition for getting rid of the Christmas tree. In the school. Right, in the school, in the public school I went to, which is about one-third Jewish. So again, the point is obvious. that it's, it's in our interest as a minority, but it's more than that. It turns the American Jew into the ideal American. Because then the American is living out the true values of America, taught to us by the most tolerant religious refugees in history, the Puritans, who have taught us the importance of religious freedom and separation of church and state. And therefore, therefore, when I had to teach a group of uh, a Hartman study group here that included a woman who was, at least people told me she was at some one time a mayor of Los Angeles, 
And she talked about her big struggle with Chabad, who wanted to put up a menorah in a public space. And she saw herself as an American and as a reformed Jew fighting the battle to keep the neutral public square. Mm -hmm. right? Which leads us to our last, I wouldn't say but our last group, which is Chabad. What does Chabad do with Hanukkah? Why is it such a central value for who they are and what they stand for? I'll let one. Read to your speaker. Read, um, my Rebbe. Can you read, please, where it says, the Chassid asked the Rebbe, okay? Page 11. The Chassid asked Rebbe, what is a Chassid? The Rebbe answered, a Chassid is a street lamp lighter. In olden days, there was a person in every town who would light the gas street lamps with the lighting carried at the end of a long pole. On the street corners, the lamps were there in readiness, waiting to be lit. A street lamp lighter has a pole with fire. He knows that the fire is not his own, and he goes around lighting all lamps on his roof. What does this have to do with Chabad? It's exactly what Chabad is. That's what makes Chabad have nothing to do with the rest of the Orthodox world. It's why the, the Rabbi of the, 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 um, the Rabbi in B'nai Brak said, what's the religion closest to Judaism, Chabad? Because he, he really thought the messianism of Chabad made it a vodazara, made it a sect. Right? But what makes Chabad unique is that they're willing to go out into the world to do what? Light. Light. They, are, they are the shamus, and that's how they see themselves. I've brought lots of sources that talk about that. They are the shamus going out to find all of the Jews whose candles have been put out by living in the darkness of what misguided people call the enlightened world of democracy and Western culture. They are the children of light, and the others are caught in the, ch are the children who have, through darkness, has overcome them. What is the meaning of a candle for Chabad? It goes back, of course, to Mishlei. Ne'er Hashem, Mishmat Adam. Everybody's neshoma, their pintal yid, that neshoma is a candle. But somebody has to light it. And we're the Chabad Nikim, we're going to go out and light that Jewish candle. And one candle at a time, one person at a time, following Hillel, that we add a candle every single night, is part of this battle. Now, I call it a battle because Chabad takes the Maccabean language of war and readapts it. So, for example, in Israel, when you have, maybe also here, you have a mitzvah tank. It goes around. And what's the name of the youth movement of Chabad? Sivot Tashem. And it's organized as a military thing with ranks and missions. They use military language the way the Zionists called themselves Chalutzim, which are the people going out in front of the battle. But they were, for the Zionists, the battle was fought by doing agricultural work. For Chabad, the battle is fought by going out and finding a Jewish kid and getting, teaching him everything you learned in the Cheder. And there's a, there's a powerful notion there. And therefore, what new mitzvah did they invent for Hanukkah? We said before lighting the Hanukkah menorah in the public space in order, to, in order to speak to the Jews who are lost in the public space of the West and bringing them back, making Reform Jews very uncomfortable overall. And some conservative Jews, because of the sense that it's a violation of the church and state, which is what Matityahu taught all the Americans when he taught about the importance of separation of church and state, as we read earlier. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, the Haredim don't like the Zionist version, right? Because the Zionists claim to be the true followers of Judah the Maccabee. But if Judah the Maccabee were to come back in Israel, what would he say about the Zionist Maccabees? According to the Haredim, he would say, how did you take Jewish symbols and turn them into a national form of assimilation? Elias Bickerman, in his history of the Maccabean period, he portrays the high priesthood, no offense to anybody, the high priest Jason and Menelaus as being the reformed Jews, the German reformed Jews of that period, who wanted to combine Zeus with our God, because both Zeus and our God are called Elohe Hashamayim. Right? So anyway, they can integrate their Judaism in within the wider modern Hellenist polis. That was essential. 
So what Haredim say, that's exactly what the Zionists did. They took legitimate Jewish symbols and they turned them into symbols of Greek Western culture. So what's the Israeli tank called? Merkava. The Merkava. What happened to Ezekiel's Merkava? <laughs> the Zohar stuff turned into a tank. And what happened to the Maka? What happened? And what do Jews in, in Jerusalem do? They go Teddy Kolek, they go to the Eats Edion. That's what they call it. That is the Stadion, the stadium built by Teddy Kolek on Shabbat. That's what they do with it. And what do they call the Knesset? Named after the Bed Knesset? They call it Mishkan HaKnesset. Look what they did. They turned it into a tabernacle, that place. And the court system it doesn't do Mishpat because it follows secular law. And of course, what happens with the term Maccabi? Maccabi, of course, is the best Israeli basketball team. And why are they so good? Because you guys have a lockout in the NBA, so we got some really great African-American players, some of whom have converted to Judaism in order to, in order to count as Israeli citizens, because you're only allowed to have three non-Israelis on the team. And what do they drink at the Maccabi games? Maccabi beer. beer. And they have the Maccabiah. What would the original Maccabees say? So what's happening here is that everybody is getting a piece of the elephant. <laughs> and then making it, not that elephant, the, you know, that I don't know what I'm talking about, and they're making that the center of what their message is, and they're identifying other Jews as being the source that is destroying the Jewish people and destroying Judaism and is totally inauthentic. Of course, the Haredim are not going to join the Maccabees by going to the Israeli army, are they? They're also being highly selected in their reading of the Maccabean tradition. So, what we have to ask is, have we prepared our Jewish constituency to understand that they're living in a cultural civil war? Have we gotten them to understand what is at stake? Do we understand fully, and I think you do understand fully, that if we don't succeed in our drashot, in making, creating an interpretation of Judaism and of Hanukkah, which is powerfully evocative for our congregants, then the people who will claim to have the lock on what Judaism really stands for are the ones who are not going to go to Ahino Amnini's concert unless they're going there to throw rocks and to break it up. If we, and, and that is the problem in Israel. It's one of the reasons that Daniel has put so much work at the Hartman Institute in creating a program for over 75,000 Israeli high school kids, Mamlachti high school kids, about the relationship of Judaism and democracy, Judaism and Jewish identity, because he wants people to be able to say, I am Jewish, and he wants the teachers who are secular to be able to say, I am representing my interpretation of Judaism, and other people have others, and not to hand it over to the ultra-Orthodox as the one who can claim authenticity. Now, that doesn't mean we have to encourage that the cultural battle be done with daggers, but it means that there's something of the zealot, though it's a pretty hard word for us to use there's something of the zealot that we need to fight we need to bring into our battles there has to be something of our anger at the desecration of judaism as we read it and as we read our the other people the children of darkness and of course the language of darkness and light is such an awful language we have to see this of course as not only an internal jewish battle but we have to look at the big world and ask ourselves What's our relationship to religious fundamentalism? What's our response to radical Islam? What's our response to what's happening in America in terms of those things? And then Hanukkah, I think, will become incredibly relevant also in our cultural world. Right? At the same time, we need to have Hanukkah also speak to the individual Jew, not just to the political, cultural Jew, and in that sense, we have to get those Jews to say, what are my personal values that I want to nurture within my home, that I want to share with the world? What button am I willing to say that I believe in and I want to support? Because when individuals take seriously their values, then they become the most powerful forms of candles without a knife 
They witness in the way they live to the values in their home and in their communities, and they share that with the larger world. And it's that that we need to develop. That takes courage, and it takes a lot of faith. You didn't get to David Hartman's article. You can read that on your own. But you know, remember anybody remember what David Hartman's interpretation of the miracle of the vessel of oil that burned for eight days? He said the miracle is not that the vessel burned for eight days. The miracle is that the Jews were willing in trying to create Jewish institutions and Jewish life to begin their institutions and to light that little bit of oil, not being able to figure out where they're going to get the money and the energy and the kalach for the next seven days. And it's that, that faith, that a little bit of light truly believed in will generate more and more energy and more and more support and more and more light in the world. That we don't live in a world of zero-sum giving, where if you give there, the Jews won't have money for this. And we don't live in a world of zero-sum energy, which is that we have a limited amount of energy. We have the possibility, says David, for love, energy, and light propagate much greater power when they start it off. That, of course, is the miracle and the terror of the atom bomb. <laughs> right? But that's really what we're talking about. We have to believe in our ability with a little bit of light to generate a lot more light. That's <laughs> Thank you.